Gibraltar's glorious resistance to the enemy is suitably honoured in the bomb-battered Palace Square Valletta, when Lord Gort VC, Governor and Commander-in-Chief, presents the people of Malta with their George Cross. Sir George Borg, the Chief Justice, receives the decoration for the citizens. He then takes the casket containing the cross and the King's letter which accompanies it to the stand from which the people of Malta may view their cherished honour until such time as it is taken to every village and town in the island. No people on earth have withstood so much as these loyal and stout-hearted Maltese who now read the King's words of admiration. A young volunteer soldier who was reprimanded for pretending to be an official cameraman that day has earned a place in Maltese history. Not because of the historic film that he took, but because of an extraordinary gift. I served in Malta for two and a half to three years in the 4th Heavy Anti-Aircraft Regiment and I returned after 48 years last year and was saddened to see the state of the gun sites as there didn't seem to be sufficient recognition given to the gunners I determined when we came back home to have a look round for some 3-7 anti-aircraft guns and the war office and all the official places informed me there weren't any to be had in Britain and I was to look around Cyprus and other places. Having been searching for these guns for a long time I was out with my wife and blow me if we didn't find within half an hour from home at Rhythm, a dealer was selling these pieces of artillery and had just the very guns we wanted and I did a deal there and then and bought four three seven inch heavy anti-aircraft guns for Malta. The Vickers guns weigh about 12 tonnes with the platforms on which have been removed and the shells would fire to a limit of about 35,000 feet and uh, they gave a good account of themselves. This was probably one of the most popular of the anti-aircraft guns, the middle range. The dial here uh, was uh, the information was fed from either radar or from the predictor and the two needles here, the inside dial would go round and the operator on this gun would match up the needle to the white blob there and that would give us the bearing of the gun and there's one on the other side for the elevation the combination of the two would give us the information required hopefully uh, obviously we have to turn these handles, these are stiff now and have to be lubricated, but they gave us the information to elevate and traverse the gun in the right direction. It would be a 12-man gun team and one would be responsible bringing the shells over and he would push the nose of the shell in here. Another man would be operating this lever to set the fuse and then he would drop it in the tray up here which of course would be down with the gun elevator be down here and then it would be rammed into the breech this fellow here and it'd be ready for firing 
Another man would be here on the platform with his hand ready on this lever and the gun would fire. Although there was a deafening roar every time this fired, it's uh, strange how one got acclimatised to it. Uh, sometimes we were off duty and through the night we'd sleep not knowing whether they'd fired or not. But um, there were no ear pads or any protection at all. And today even there are many fellows who suffer deafness due to the constant uh, sound of the gun firing. I think it's an honour, really, because the Royal Artillery, the guns, were their colours, as you know. So this, to us, is... Um, I think it's a nice little honour to move it for them. Really mm. do. I've always been keen on photography. Mother bought this for me, second hand, for my 21st birthday. Uh, it's a Kodak, uh, clockwork, very compact as you can see, very primitive but it did the trick. It, it was rather a long time before I actually saw the results of the films because I uh, had to wait uh, until we went away from Malta. Uh, and they'd been in my kit for two and a half years before I got to uh, Cairo and had them processed there. I had to be careful to flannel my way through the sensor when we reviewed them. And then they impounded them and it was after the war that I managed to get them. So here we are in the Mediterranean with our convoy and uh, our ship, the Port Chalmers was one of six merchantmen carrying ammunition, food, of course, petrol, aviation spirit, and although they did their best to keep us fit with PT, boxing, and so on, the popular pastime was sunbathing between the raids. And to avoid using the radio, in the early part of the convoy, the small naval craft would come alongside, fire a line across our bows and uh, pass a message for the captain. Just here you'll see a plane coming over which dropped a torpedo and caught the cruise of the Manchester which is firing its guns now. Another casualty was the destroyer the fearless there's a column of smoke there 
and several naval vessels picking up survivors. It had to be finished off to avoid being left for the enemy to pick it up. And we continued on our way to Malta. Malta, an island just 17 miles long, under British rule since the turn of the 19th century, had been unprepared for war. There were no fighter aircraft, no submarine shelters, and only a third of the number of anti-aircraft guns considered necessary to defend the quarter of a million Maltese. The British War Cabinet considered a French plan which could have led to the island being given to Italy after the Germans had been defeated. But Prime Minister Churchill ruled it was a time to show strength, not weakness, and the former stronghold of the Knights of St. John must be held. Mussolini was intent on gaining complete control of the Mediterranean. Within hours of declaring war on June the 10th, 1940, his bombers launched a series of attacks. The first to die on Malta were members of an anti-parachute unit, killed by a stick of bombs at Fort St. Elmo, where the island's president was then an army doctor. Soon afterwards, uh, it was time for the usual morning sick parade. Uh, normally, in this fort, I'd have about four or five, you know, with, with minor ailments. Occasionally, someone needing to be sent to hospital. We only had one military hospital at that time in Tafa. It was the 90th uh, General Hospital. And uh, on that morning, <laughs> not surprisingly, there was quite a long queue. Practically half the uh, the company that was uh, living, and um, so I got out to the door of my uh, inspection room and told them, "We are all afraid. I must be very white in my face, uh, so I, I share your your fear. But uh, this is where we have to stay. Anyone who is really sick, uh, please stay, and I'll send him to hospital if he needs to be, but not the others." And one by one, within minutes, everyone slowly went back. Not one remained. <laughs> and which was uh, quite a good start of a war rapport between their doctor and, and, and the company. And the rapport which I uh, helped, uh, hoped to, to, to have kept all along the six and a half years I was in, uh, in the army during the war. Four slow-flying Gloucester Gladiator biplanes, which had been left in crates by a passing warship, were hastily prepared for combat, to be flown initially by pilots with no battle experience. One was soon damaged. The remaining three, nicknamed Faith, Hope and Charity, faced an Italian Air Force with more than 200 warplanes. At a special reunion for members of Allied and Axis fighter squadrons in London, the last man alive who flew gladiators in Malta revealed that timing was crucial. You had to have instant reaction to attack. Um, and of course, your main object in, in a fighter aircraft is to attack yourself and not to be attacked. So um, if you had any embarrassing moments, they were very, very short-lived indeed, because if they weren't short-lived, then you'd have it. Always the plane is beautiful an aircraft to fly, highly maneuverable, fully aerobatic, but um, you had to be, say, you had to have your finger in if you got jumped. Italian bombers were escorted by CR-42s, which had a better performance than the Gladiator, and by the Mackie, which was a full 70 miles an hour faster. The Mackie 200 had a better performance than the biplane, obviously. It was born later, and they had a better armament. A small group of hurricanes flew in to take over the aerial defence, facing waves of up to 70 bombers a day for the rest of the year. Three top Malta pilots who served with 249, the most successful fighter squadron, returned to their old mess at Medina. Canadian Bob Middlemiss and Laddie Lucas, who flew Spitfires, and hurricane ace Don they Stones. They were brave, those, those hurricane pilots. Well, they, now, they certainly were. We had a month of it, and that was quite enough for me. And I would have taken the first boat home if I could. 
Make no mistake, it was really, it was a wonderful show that those fellows of yours put oh, up. That's very nice of you to say so. We were very delighted to see you, I can tell you that. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Frightening airplanes fact, apply. I, think it, I think it was Warburton who, who said, when, when I, I, I was leading the so-called wing then, 13 serviceable hurricanes, <laughs> with four serviceable Spitfires, the ones that escaped from the refueling thing, they got bombed on the ground the day they arrived. And Warburton, I think it was, said, oh, there goes the Hurricanes and their fighter escort. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Right. <laughs> In January 1941, the war entered a new phase with the arrival of the Luftwaffe in Sicily. Felix Saar was a fighter pilot. Adversely, have the order to accompany the bombers. And the second, to shoot down the... English fighters, who was our Malta. And the importance of the war, the ships who was coming to shoot out to, to give to the British. The Royal Navy's newest armadact carrier, Illustrious, was attacked and damaged while guarding a convoy carrying vital food and ammunition. Damaged by six bombs and with 126 of the crew killed, she limped into the Grand Harbour for repairs. Six days later, the Luftwaffe launched its first devastating attack on Malta, with Illustrious the main target. It was like hell. Hell let loose it was. You couldn't speak like to, to your friend unless you spoke into his ears, like you know, because it was hell let loose. I mean, when it was a box barrage for the doctor, like, you see all the guns around the island. They were given a certain angle and a certain bearing to point their barrels and just fire away, like, and that created a box of steel, splintered steel, around the dockyard, which, when the plane dived into it, which was very like, you know, it's dangerous for him, and not only dangerous, where well, with all that shells exploding, because the shells would explode after so, they couldn't aim properly like it. Well, at first the last is red, really. What I remember most, it was its um, suddenness, which it had turned up, and also the, uh, the quality of the dive bombing. The dive bombing was so uh, intense, and so uh, it seemed, it seemed, to come down perpendicularly. It is a, a ferocious attack aimed at this, at this illustrious. And um, it, 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 as the ship was built in such a, a narrow area, any misses would have hit the villages around it. In fact, a tremendous amount of damage was done to Senglia, Vittoriosa, Corradino, all those areas. But on the other hand, uh, the defense, the, the, the attack defense, mainly the harbor barrage, the Grand Harbor barrage had just been contrived uh, a day before it had been completed, and um, the Germans had their full blast of it. And they suffered so much that, again, the bombing was never quite of the same caliber. All through the war, I never seen anything like it again. The illustrious somehow survived repeated attacks and sailed for Alexandria. More than a hundred German air crew are thought to have been killed along with many civilians. Hundreds were trapped beneath tons of rubble as whole streets were destroyed. When I arrived, about six months after the illustrious affair, this harbour wasn't as attractive as it is now because wherever we looked there were masts of ships sticking up through the water and on the other side there I remember there was a floating dock that had been bombed and submerged and when it came to taking the cargo off it was a very long-winded business there were lighters stretching a quarter of a mile or so from the boat to the quayside and everything was manhandled it was really dreadful Two days after we arrived, the Italians sent over a fleet of these e-boats to sink our ships. Unfortunately, there was a premature explosion which brought half the bridge down on top of the leader, 
and that thwarted the whole operation for them. It took Maltese gunners just six minutes to end the attack, destroying most of the boats, crewed by the elite of the Italian Navy. Two got away, but the following morning, as soon as daylight came, the RAF went out with a couple of fighters and finished them off. And that's the story of how we, the one and only uh, operation of the Italian Navy trying to attack Malta. Malta was surrounded by the enemy. Supplies were being sent nearly a thousand miles from Alexandria or Gibraltar. The island was ringed with heavy anti-aircraft guns, guarding the three main airfields at Takali, Luca and Halfar. Stan Fraser's battery was near the village of Crendy. Ju 88s they were murder, they were. Weren't they? they came down and rooted you out. Yes. And they had a machine gun post there when the Messerschmitts, while we were firing at them, and the Messerschmitts run across here low and strafed the lot of us. Everybody yes. got a bit. They could got just a bit come in, in at here. sea level and come up over the cliffs. Um, and but well, you couldn't were, see were, them because you were, were firing before up we there. Knew. Most of the enemy aircraft used to come in at that point, turn round, which is, would be Crendy Strip when they over that way. And yeah. we wonder where they were going to dive whenever they uh, reached at a certain point, you know. That's uh, another island off Malta which people don't know about, Filfla. And it was used for target practice during the war. And if we were off duty, the lads used to go and there was a special place we used to sit on the cliffs and we'd watch these, uh, the bombing practice. Sometimes we just, there wasn't any bombing practice, we'd be looking for convoys that never came. And sometimes we'd get a surprise not being out there when the enemy would fly low over the water and suddenly the first thing we knew about it, they were going over the horizon there on top of us, catching us on the words because if they flew low, they would escape the radar or GL as we called it, and they'd take us by surprise. Of course there'd be all hell let loose. And uh, but generally speaking, Phil Flo was our favourite, well the only bit of scenery we had to enjoy. When the bomb dropped here, you it seemed to hang there. You could you knew you was going to be it and everybody dropped on the floor of the command post. I was late getting to the alcove and I was trying to shove them in to get in. I could see this damn great black thing coming. And then it hit the ground here and everybody was thrown in the air. Can you remember that? It used to take yeah. you up in the air and drop you down. And you had a terrific headache, didn't you? I was frightened then. I remember an officer once attempted a classical uh, music. Uh, he had a little wind-up gramophone. I think we all fell asleep while we were playing Night of the Bear Mountain or something. And uh, that was the last of the classical concerts. But the biggest laugh we had, I think, was the... We used to have about three times a year a concert party. and We achieved our own family of the Buggins or something like that. I remember I was Grandma Buggins. We borrowed clothes from the village. And uh, there was a little Master Buggins even a little bugger, I think. But uh, it all went down very well. I mean, it, we got in the latest topical tunes from Blighty. I've got spurs that jingle, jangle, jingle, and red sails in the sunset. You don't hear them now, of course. And um, we introduced those to the thing. We'd have potted humour about characters in the camp, particularly the officers. And they enjoyed it, took it in good part, and so on. The plane passed over us, and the shell burst in him and split him in two. That's right. And he fell just at the back of Azikim Ruins over here That's and right. blew up. That's right. And we went up to pick them up in sandbags, the crew. And this Tony in the village now, he's got, he went up with us, he was a little boy of nine, and he picked the spanners up out of the plane. There were four dead. Uh, it was JU-88. Well, it, yeah. that was a late round. It was a late round, hit him in the, right underneath, in, blew him in the cabin, it must have shattered it, you see. What would happen there is the, the predictor would forecast the future position, but the plane would change course, and by a fluke, mm. it was a fluke. It was a fluke, yeah. A late round We're hit happy it. about it. He would be most upset. He was, he Especially got a headache. Especially when he was in his that. sandbag. You yeah. wasn't, you see, 
If you're firing at a plane, he's got to keep a straight course for 30 seconds. That's right. Or he throws you. That's right. You see, that was the trouble. Yeah. And he took he took a wrong turn to miss us, miss the, the other three rounds, and run into the late one. Run into the late one. And he was dead. I didn't smoke, so I'd swap my cigarette ration, horrible things, for chocolate. And you made it last when you got into bed, those biscuits, hard biscuits. I'd eat them, not biting them off. I used to gnaw at it like a mouse and put a little bit of chocolate flavour with it. And it went down great. Ah, those things, they do remind you of those times. I noticed there's a flag over there. Looks like a white flag. Well, that's one thing we never had, a white flag in Malta. The gun was in the centre of the pit, about here. And uh, you can see where the cables went through the concrete to the command post. This was a special uh, pit for pre-fused ammunition, for special barrages, harbour, Luca Aerodrome and so on. And uh, the information came through from the command post, which is in the centre of the site. This, the ice left down here, by the way, in this uh, alcove. And um, we were there for about two and a half years. I'll show you where my corner was, shall I? It's in here. Oh, it's cooler in here. And my corner was over here. I had the bed down against this wall. The grapes weren't here, unfortunately, when we were here. See, I could have lay in bed and just pinched a grape or two, like the Romans. And on here, I had my cupboard with my diaries in, handy, because we had the siesta after one o'clock, and I'd get busy with my diaries. The sergeant had a privileged position in this room. He could keep an eye on me, if it was necessary. But uh, we all lived as one happy family, although he was a sergeant, he was just one of the boys. We all went on our day off together. and. Uh, there are no windows here now, but I remember we had a wooden frame and glass for the first few months. The glass soon went. But um, in a way, looking back, it was a wonderful period. I wouldn't have missed it for worlds, really. At the time, it was different. Still, I better not reminisce, reminisce too much. Don't let them get a bit emotional about it, I suppose. They were good times. They were good times. You can't help thinking about the fellows who didn't come back. Barrett. It was him or me. We saw the bombs actually coming down. Three days later, we were on the burial party. In May 1941, the Luftwaffe left Sicily to attack targets in the Middle East. But in November, the dreaded Stukas and Junker 88s, under the command of Field Marshal Kesselring, were ordered to leave the Russian front to neutralize Malta. What was to become known as the Black Winter was about to begin. fairly comprehensive diary the whole time, actually. I'll just pick out some of the highlights. I see this was uh, 28th of December, 41. 
There are many columns of smoke rising into the sky caused by the fires on the aerodromes and enormous explosions. New Year's Eve, last night was the worst we've had for raids. The alarm would sound just after we'd got into bed for a minute or two. Again, here on the 12th of January, a bit of good news. Gunnar Fraser was appointed Lance Bombardier. Most of the men seemed pleased for me. And I was pleased because it meant another sixpence a day. 25th of January. Large formations of both bombers and fighters were to be seen during the daytime. Fifteenth of February, we were in action all day. Seventeenth of March, today we had five casualties when a shell burst very low over our site. They spurted machine gun bullets at me. With only a handful of British fighters in the air, the gunners, at times starved of ammunition, faced hundreds of sorties a day. The island suffered the equivalent of the devastating attack on Coventry for 30 consecutive days. On the 3rd of May, last evening, we experienced the worst direct attack. One of our number was killed and several seriously injured. And two days later, on the 5th of May, today the funeral party left for a burial. This is the fourth time we've sent a party. There's rather a depressed atmosphere about the campaign. There's rather a depressed atmosphere about the campaign. Sorry about that. After the attack, we used to go out and uh, because we used to have the spotters and used to tell us where building had been, has been uh, bombed. And used to go and seen even in the streets that we used to pick a lot, but not all the civilians, my friend, even, even soldiers and whoever used to be in the streets because in Malta, really, they didn't mind much during the war. As I'm saying, everybody was busy you know, of doing something. So, uh, we used to pick uh, not only civilians, even military, Navy, Air Force, those whoever we meet in this street, we used to pick them as well. And uh, of course, uh, we have seen people get trapped under the debris and the demolition squad, they used to ca come and uh, we used to lead them. Look, over there, there are people, so please, quickly, just, and these people, both people, they used to clear the debris, you know, and some of them, they have been saved. A lot of people <laughs> have died in my hands, you know, and I, I used to be all with blood, but that was the part, that it was the, the, the part which I should do in that moment, you see, and uh, of course it was a, a, a moment of unbelievable what, what, what you could see. Uh, women, children, and you know, men, army, navy, however it is, see, because you could see any, anything. Joe Adduce was awarded the military cross after the Luftwaffe tried to wipe out his gun position. The Stukas and JU-88s came in in flights of about 20. As soon as we opened fire, they split up and some of them, not all, came down for us. I mean, it was a bit alarming because wherever you were, you thought that the bombs were going right on top of you. Wherever you moved, all you could see were bombs coming right on top of you. The earth round Salina is mostly clay. So they made very big craters, but luckily casualties were not high. They managed to hit two of the guns and drop 
inside the barbed wire perimeter, 128. That means that's the number of craters we had over here, which as you, you can see, it's not very, very big. But notwithstanding, we always carried on, and there wasn't one day when we were not in action. There was so much destruction that the German pilots were becoming short of targets. I saw this guy, and he obviously at this stage, he must have seen me. He waited till I got to the end of the road, and hit there, around the corner, and he machine gunned me for the first time. And I thought that was that. But then I realised he was carrying around having a second shot at me. But by that time, of course, I started looking for shelters and found a rock, and I was well and truly behind the rock. And he fired away, and I thought that was the end of that. So I got on my boat back and realised he was coming in for the third time. And of course, at that stage, I realised that I had to take, again, evasive action. Got onto this beach post, which was very close, and I knew that I'd be impregnable. Uh, and I think he realised that he'd lost that, that particular battle, and so he waved at me, and I waved back at him, followed by a few expletives, I should think, and that was the end of the session. All these shops were absolutely, completely, I wouldn't say wiped out, but they were so badly battered, the shop windows. There, there was no pilfering, because there was nothing inside to pilfer. <laughs> nothing to take. Nothing I to pilfer. That. We had to come looking for a good meal, and uh, somewhere where we could get a, a clean bed and sheets for one or six months a night. Mm. And what about the girls? Straight Street. Oh, there were plenty of girls, oh. and those who wanted them. But, I see. Uh, mm. They were there, and uh, you just had to take your chance, I suppose when you could get it. raid they had took the top part off mm -hmm. and the next time it finished it more or less but the building was magnificent oh, all those columns and statues and, uh, and the architecture was, was really wonderful the rubble in the road. everything fell into the road the oh yes street. yes yes and from the bridge over there to here there wasn't war then one single single passage where just one 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 man could could walk but the shambles we we, we had and what was left mm -hmm. The Maltese devout Catholics were convinced that with God's help the island would not fall. On the 9th of April 1942, a bomb fell through the dome of Mostar Church while 300 people were sheltering and praying during the raid. It failed to go off and no one was injured. It was considered a miracle. Corporal Jim Somerville risked his life to remove it. I ran into the church and sure enough, there was a bomb lying there on the floor. It come through this hole in the dome. Naturally enough, I ran out again to see what held back again. We rolled the bomb out the church, down the steps, and on to the truck. The truck then took off in the direction of St Paul's Bay. Salvatore Magro had been in the church when the bomb entered. If you read the story of the building of the church, you will see that it was built with love. It was a miracle because God it was, we love God and we love the Blessed Virgin and we love, we love the church. A replica bomb now stands in the church. made a nostalgic return to the former pub where the members of his battery used to call. Hello, Jane. How are you? Do you remember all those years ago? Yeah. You had the pictures on the wall. 
You remember the pictures you had on the wall? Uh, uh, in, yeah. in the bar. And yeah. we used to come and drink your ambeat. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, it is a long time ago, but here are some of the gun teams look. Mm, yes. And Howard Bell, he yes, writes yes. to you. You came to this concert, I remember, with the family. And oh, we, uh, we borrowed the family, clothes, yeah, yeah. we borrowed skirts from yeah, you and, uh, yeah. and hats and things like that. Here they are, look, it's probably your old Sunday coat. The old sign was brought back, this time, though, to hang in Stan's honour. One advantage is the hurricane was made of bits and it didn't all fall to pieces at the same time, if you know what I mean. It would always get to your home, whatever the damage. It was Warren Girder construction, you know, part fabric, part, part metal. And uh, uh, one, one thing I think that we, we, we are rather pleased about in the old hurricane was when we formed the night fighter flight and our, with long-range tanks, painted black, you know. And our job was to go and suppress the enemy air, airfields at night in Sicily, which did reduce the night uh, bombing here to a mere trickle. The thing yes, was that you were never outflown, but you were outperformed, and those oh, are two quite there. different things. Yeah. The hurricane was uh, best armed, but not so quickly. And so we could uh, take the uh, um, hurricane from all sites, from all uh, frontiers. And uh, there was not uh, many. The Italians uh, loved to fly. They, 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 yeah. were, they were born to fly. And I used mm. to say to you, the boys, as you remember very well, Bob, I used to say, you know, any country which could produce racing drivers of the caliber of Enzo Ferrari or Tazio Nuvolari is bound to be able to fly aeroplanes. So you boys want to watch out because you're not yes. tending to get rather, rather slap happy with and them. And so trophy pilots. Well, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they were they had real ability actually sure. to fly. But the and funnily enough, that friend of mine, that German friend of mine, Edu Neumann, made the point because he was dealing with them, of course, in in uh, North Africa. He said that while they had great ability as, as, a, as pilots, mm -hmm. the caliber of their aircraft was lower, really, than mm -hmm. ours or the Germans. Yeah, and he yeah. said to me, you know, the truth of the matter is, if you've got an aeroplane which is slightly inferior to the other man's, it's very difficult, really, to be aggressive. And so mm -hmm. these fellows, they used to fly over the top here, and we used to see them, and uh, you could see them doing these upward rolls and sort of rolls mm -hmm. off the top mm -hmm. and coming down, you know, and up again, a roll to the right and one to the left and then give a squirt mm -hmm. at something. I mean, they, they had the real sort of joie de vivre, those sure. fellows, and, sure. and, and yet yeah, yeah. there were some very good ones. Oh, yes. And, uh, oh, I, I know uh, that Jack Ray, the New Zealander, had a yeah. tremendous fight with one chap all the way back to Sicily yeah. and they'd sort of given him a, a half a dozen squirts so that with his Australian uh, number two, Alan Yates. And they turned round to come home because they're getting short of petrol. And suddenly they found this fellow following them and giving them a squirt back. Yeah, yeah. And they were, uh, there's no doubt, they had a lot of spirit. But I think their aeroplanes weren't so good. In Italian Air Force, we love aerobatics. A and it's known, it's a fact. Just now, some pilots said, well, when they flew, when they saw flying aerobatics, oh, that is an Italian one. Actually, uh, that we, we, we were trained for that and was a kind of defense. We didn't have uh, in 41 aircraft to aircraft communication, so we were for ourselves uh, we have to do something. I had about two weeks in 249 when I first got here on the, on the day stuff, and uh, the, the very large units of the fleet were in, in the harbor, and we were told that this um, Kent 1007 was coming over to photograph the fleet. And so six of us were sent off, and I, I happened to be leading. And uh, we, we went in on him, and um, okay, we knocked him down. He, went, he, he, he fell in a ball of flame somewhere in the water there. And we were told when we got to the ground that, that, that uh, one had survived. Well, now, 
As, just before I opened fire, something fell off the aircraft, and I thought it was a bomb or something, rather, and then anyway went in. And, and the survivor was apparently the rear gunner. And the intelligence officer went down to interview him in the hospital at Califano. And uh, then he, th he was asked, why did you abandon the aircraft? Did you tell your captain? And he said, no, I see six hurricanes. I get out. It's not a my war. <laughs> well, <laughs> and he's alive. Oh, he's alive. <laughs> well, I remember also when, when the Italians flew the 109s, you could always tell because they were tight formation. Yes, that's quite They right. didn't fly, you know, the widespread no, right. uh, formation right. that the Germans did. To win the air battle, Malta needed Spitfires. 47 had flown in on April the 20th, but they were monitored on radar and bombed as soon as they landed. New tactics were needed. We'd got an altogether different organization on the ground. We had the army helping us with the refueling because all the bowsers had been uh, destroyed and it was all being being uh, filled with uh, five-gallon cans. We had the army working with the Royal Air Force and we had actually had the Navy as well. I think that surprised him a bit when they found they were <laughs> working on, on Spitfires on the, on the ground. And they would got it down to the point where they reckoned that on the turn round they could do it in half an hour. Now, when it actually came down to it, there was a Malta trained pilot in each pen. I mean, I can remember when I landed, uh, one of my flight commanders, in fact, took over my aircraft. And they were off the ground between 10 and 12 minutes, not 30. And so, when Kesselring, who was commanding the Air Force in Sicily, sent the raids in, we had the aeroplanes up in the air, and they honestly never saw what hit them. And that was the real turn of the Battle of Malta. On what became known as the glorious 10th of May, 63 German aircraft were damaged or destroyed. The Spitfire could outturn the Messerschmitt 109, which gave the pilot a key advantage. I was very good pilots, so Spitfire pilots. It was horrible for us. And we ever had many pilots shoot down. I got behind the 109 and shot it down and Immediately, I thought, uh-oh, his number two will be on my tail. So I was turning and looking, and suddenly there was a crump, and my hand fell off the stick, and I was spinning down, and uh, tried to get out of, the sp out of the plane and the spin, and I kept being thrown back in. So got back in with my good hand, mm -hmm. stopped the spin, mm -hmm. rolled over on my back, and fell out, and floated down gently. The squadron looked for me at the wrong place for some unknown reason. They thought I was shot down on the west side and I was actually shot down outside on the east, out, right out there. Had a hard time getting into my dinghy. Finally got in and was paddling back and that evening two airplanes went out to look after the minesweepers and they spotted this lonely chap out there <laughs> making his way back. They had to go over me, came back and I wasn't sure if they were going to have a fire their guns and so I was prepared to jump in the water. I don't know what good that would have done. You put that in a very modest way but you know all day I mean you must have been shot down uh, I should think probably fairly late in the morning That's right. and uh, almost all day we had airplanes out there looking for you and you know because you're a nice guy. <laughs> My engine blew up at 400 feet that is about 13 seconds on the brolly if you work it out you see and landed astride of stone fence that had fall was broken by thorn bush, which is all right. Uh, surrounded by Maltese because my aeroplane was burning in the next little field about the size of a tennis court. And, uh, I, and they said, Tadashi, uh, German, German, German. I, I ripped my uh, May West off and everything showed my wings, which, which was okay. I was then rescued by a uh, um, uh, Royal Artillery officer, a gunner officer, who was manning the Beaufort. Uh, defences around the Tikali airfield, you see, and he came up and he spoke a bit of Maltese, so, so they went away. They accidentally took my parachute because I believe it was rather useful for silk uh, underwear in Malta, don't you know, <laughs> <laughs> And he then made the most, it could only happen to two Englishmen, I think, and he said, uh, uh, I have happened to have a rather good bottle of malt in my cabin near the battery. Shall we go and see if it's any good? So we did. And by the time they sent transport for, for me, because they thought I was dead anyway, it was 
Merthyr's Lane, we had had about half a bottle of that malt, and I never felt better in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Great chap. If I were asked the $64,000 question, which I would rather go through, bombing or hunger, I would rather select bombing. Mm, I can understand that in a way, but, um, well, I don't know, really. It's a hard choice, isn't it? It isn't. Bombing cannot be as continuous as hunger. To work, to bed, waking up in the morning, any time of the day, you feel hungry. And there is nothing to eat. Mm. Literally nothing. Or so little that it's not enough to keep uh, a man going. A young man, I, I, I must say. You were young. Oh, yes, I was a flourishing 24. But, yes, and uh, you were on a gun site. Yes. And you wanted to eat. Yes. And right. I I suppose bombing could cure both of them, couldn't it? As food supplies had dwindled, communal feeding stations, or victory kitchens as they became known, were introduced. Doris Bonello was a supervisor at Medina. At the kitchen we used to have a lot of vegetables, all kinds of vegetables, uh, nips uh, uh, and potatoes and uh, pumpkins. It were available at that moment. Then now uh, we used to have uh, corned beef, herrings, meat. They used to send us sliced meat ready. We didn't know if it was meat or anything else. We also had uh, balbuliata. That means eggs with tomatoes and macaronis. Once we had an incident because there was, the liver was not good. And so those uh, subscribers who used to have their meals at, at noon, they returned with their dish shouting and screaming and they wanted to throw uh, their plates over to us because they said it was bitter, uneatable and uh, not good for eating. And uh, they were shouting and screaming and were terrified because we're all, all of us were women and were young. And uh, then when the situation started to get a little bit calmer, they, um, we, we gave them instead a slice of corned beef and they were satisfied with some bees. And, uh, but that was a little bit... We, we took a fright, to be honest. My mother used to give us a ring or a bracelet or a necklace. And then they would give us something small for a couple of potatoes or for some oil. My mother was very sorry. My mother was very sorry. But she was happy that she was seeing us <laughs> that we are eating, at least. Do you know what I mean? She was sorry for losing her things because generally her things were inherited from her mother. Under the sea, the most intensive submarine battle in history was being fought. Submarines brought in essential supplies throughout the siege. In July 1941 alone, they carried 126 passengers, 160 gallons of fuel, 12 tons of mail, 30 tons of stores, and 6 tons of munitions. Malta's 10th flotilla of small U-class submarines was based at the former leper colony of Manol Island. 11 of the 34 were lost. John Wingate served with the fighting 10th. Most people volunteered for submarines. They loved submarines. I think they loved it because it was a sort of separate navy on your own. You were away from all the brass and uh, all the guff. We wore sarongs at sea and everybody tried to have a better sarong than the other. Uh, and of course you... you I, I, I gather Cunningham heard about this and was absolutely furious. And so we all had to dress properly but as soon as we were out, out of there we were back in sarongs trying to cope with the heat. I took passage on the submarine P-36 to come to Malta as spare crew. She was sunk a few months later by aircraft while alongside the submarine base. I then joined the P-39 and she was also sunk alongside by aircraft. I joined the P-34 which eventually became the ultimatum and she survived the war. But when she went home I joined the P-43, which was a unison, and I came home on her. They were so sensitive. For instance, they're only 700 tons, and in trimming a boat, it was very, very sensitive. If a heavy stoker was up in the fore ends and he had to go on watch, 
he had to get permission of the officer the watch in the control room to go aft because his weight moving 60 feet from one end of the boat up in the fore end to the after end in the engine room changed the whole moment of the boat and her trim, her bows would come up if her bows, you're only 12 feet below the surface and if her bows came up and showed in the surface that was suicide and in bad weather as well they were so sensitive that if you left the periscope up for more than three seconds you would break surface on one occasion we were attacked with 144 depth charges the noise was tremendous and when you had a pattern dropped around you it shook the submarine like a dog shaking a rack I think we were glad to get to sea to get away from the bombing so the one counteracted the other the British torpedo you could see it coming from miles it also made a a noise like the Welsh guards going down down the mouth whereas the, the German torpedo was silent and you couldn't see it and sometimes you'd have the embarrassing situation where a torpedo which was maintained there in Torpedo Creek across the way there something would go wrong with the gyro or the depth keeping and it would whiz above your own head which frequently happened sometimes they would go off underneath you hit the bottom because the most unpleasant area for us was Maritimo off Sicily or off Tunisia and we loathed off Tunisia and off Tripoli because the enemy had mined it unmercifully 58,000 mines laid and to go on patrol we had to go through the minefields every time we knew there was a minefield there which you could get through these minefields and this particular time we were a bit too close to when we heard the wire coming down the side of the boat and uh, of course, you hold your breath down and just wait for it to slip off the other end. That's all you can do. We, I'm afraid, kept the record for being hunted and held down. We were held down for 36 hours in deep water so we couldn't bottom off Sicily. We ran out of air. We were hunted by six destroyers for 36 hours. It was most unpleasant. We couldn't breathe, we ran out of oxygen, got the most appalling headaches. And every breath you took, you, you filled your lungs up to the very bottom. Every breath was the most appalling um, pain and effort. And of course, you still had to do your duty. There was no eating, there was no talking. You just had to stay in your bunk or sleeping on the decks with the cockroaches until this bloody awful ordeal was over and by the end of it the oxygen was having no effect whatsoever you just couldn't breathe but after surfacing the order to start the generators never came they'd all passed out the captain had passed out was unconscious he'd opened his head up on the, the side of the bridge and uh, with this sudden air they'd all passed out so eventually we saw there was nothing there. He gave the, the, the order, and uh, the, we started generators. We couldn't even light a cigarette. That's all they wanted, a cigarette. It, you, the match wouldn't light. I personally think the Fighting Tenth bloody well won the war. I, they stopped Rommel. If Rommel hadn't been stopped, yeah, the Japs were on the Irrawaddy. The Germans are coming through the Caucasus. They would have met Rommel in the Middle East oil fields, which they'd taken. The Germans have joined up there, gone through Afghanistan, and joined the Japs in the middle of India. Where would we be now? We wouldn't be standing here. I, I think it's as simple as that. Bomber crews also played a key role in sinking Rommel supply ships often with no fighter escort. And the only way to destroy a ship was to fly low along the water and at the last moment pull up and try and get the bombs into the side. It was low level daylight, unprotected, yes. And the rate of attrition was terrible in Europe and in the Mediterranean and everywhere. Uh, very brave fellows they were, and uh, most of them have gone, of course. 
rations had been cut and cut again throughout the siege as supply ships were repeatedly attacked and sunk. On the 10th of August 1942, the largest convoy ever seen entered the Mediterranean. If Operation Pedestal failed to deliver supplies to the island, surrender seemed certain. Two battleships, five aircraft carriers, eight cruisers, 32 destroyers. We thought we was in for an easy run. With this one uh, going to Malta, it really was. It, it was the one that, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you honestly, it frightened the life out of me and I know other people were. Nigeria was torpedoed. I, I was walking from, from our forward and I just got alongside the port uh, sea boat when all I remember was this tremendous thud and uh, I was smothered in cordite fumes and a terrific uh, cascade of water hit me and it virtually picked me up and threw me back to where I, I started. I was under the uh, port torpedo tubes with a bleeding in the head. Uh, badly injured at the time. Well then, uh, we just listed over 15 degrees to port. We was completely out of control. We went round in circles. And then if, uh, eventually we, um, we turned, we managed to get things under control. We turned round and made for, for Gibraltar. Over 850 Axis aircraft, submarines, e-boats, cruisers and destroyers lay ahead of the ships. A thousand sailors gave their lives and almost two-thirds of the desperately needed supplies were lost. The vital oil tanker, Ohio, was virtually carried into the Grand Harbor by two destroyers. She'd been torpedoed and holed and repeatedly bombed. The engines had blown up, fires had raged, and she'd twice been abandoned and reboarded. Edmund Baines commanded one of the destroyers. The Ohio is in a hell of a mess. Uh, she had a large hole on her left, on her port side, with a large flange sticking out, and was floating, I suspect, on a sort of air cushion. Uh, between the upper deck and the fuel in her holds. We got each side of her and made good progress. She was vital, of course, to the survival of the island because there was no fuel. It was incredible, really, that she actually made the letter at all. The state she was in was so ghastly that she could have sunk at any moment. More supplies reached the island in November and December. The siege was finally over. The island became the headquarters for the successful Allied invasion of Sicily. What you're seeing to my right is the wall map which described what happened in the invasion of Sicily, Operation Husky. This is in fact one of the biggest landings in history. It involved no less than 3,500 ships, seven divisions, and 100 miles of beaches. The green lines on the map will show you the area which was covered by the Americans, and the red lines will show you the area which was covered by the British. And the Allied commanders, including Montgomery and including Eisenhower and Cunningham, had gone to the south of Malta to see the gliders going in to the beaches. That was, in fact, the opening of the gambit of the first attack on mainland Europe. That was carrying the war into mainland Europe on Axis territory. This is very important uh, for people to realize that up to then, the Allies had been on the defensive. There were good rock shelters. Otherwise, there would have been much greater that I, for instance, twice within three days, I was in an air raid shelter in Valletta when the shelter I was in received a direct hit. 
and that is because it was solid rock. Had I been anywhere else, I wouldn't have been here today. Now, the 7,000 persons listed in this book are persons or crews of submarines, Royal Navy ships, RAF planes who went out against the enemy, preventing the enemy to sink our own ships in harbor and things like that. So they died in the defense of Malta. This is the thing. The people listed here all died in the defense of Malta. Some of them have got a grave in Malta. Some of them have got a grave in a foreign land, that is Italy or North Africa or Tunisia. And some, the sea is their grave. It's regretted, but that's what it is. And those names I have been able to get by researching in registers produced by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. There are many stories. For instance, one family in Hamroon, there was the mother, father, and one of the sons died on one particular day. Only four months later, when the other only son, the rather only son, died on board in a warship. So the whole family went. There are other stories ad infinitum. Uh, people going to work, the man goes to work and he comes home and he finds all his family, a wife and three children, all killed. It's, it's very, very, uh, very tragic. Very tragic, to say the least. Very tragic. To Malta's long and glorious history, another page was recently added with the presentation to the island of the George Cross. I got into a bit of bother taking photographs in this reserved area of the George Cross ceremony. And when I got back to camp, I was dealt with and reprimanded for taking photographs where I shouldn't have been. All the official photographers were there and there were one or two amateurs like myself. Still, although I was reprimanded, I still got my pictures, which was the main thing. When things quietened down in 43, we came over to Gozo because we had a few days leave. But we didn't travel in luxury on a liner like this, but on a small fishing type boat. I can remember the people were lying about sleeping. Some had goats with them. And the captain in his shirt sleeves come round collecting the paper money. They were George V half crowns overprinted at a shilling. And the fishermen we passed were in their little boats off the cliffs. I can remember that very vividly. It became quite a nice place to visit because there was no action over here and plenty of food because they grew it all over here. We always look forward to these few days in Gozo. Didn't come often enough. Lord, it's still as hot now as it was 50 years ago when we were here last. And I remember there were four or five of us, and we went along the, the bottom there, came along, this road wasn't here, but we went up the canyon, which we called the Grand Canyon at the time. Mind you, we were in our 20s then. I wouldn't like to be doing it now, but uh, it was sweltering hot. 
my mother was Albert. I'm a sergeant from Liverpool. And we went on to the next village just over the hill. The unforgettable sight of a war fleet steaming in to surrender itself. The main body of the Italian fleet from Spezia and Taranto stretched over the Mediterranean for a distance of five miles. Under an escort of two British battleships and a destroyer screen, the Italian warships, following the course prescribed in the armistice terms, are moving in an impressive array towards Malta. The naval wealth of a beaten nation given up in surrender. The scene in Malta Harbour recalls that day at the end of the last war when the German fleet sailed into Scarpa Flow. The Italian fleet was surrendering at three different locations here. I remember going up on the roof to see one or two of their big battleships coming out and they anchored off Valletta Harbour. To us, at least to me, it was a day that I shall never forget. Instead of as conquerors, they came as conquered, <laughs> okay? And they surrendered here. And the famous signal of Admiral Andrew Cunningham, known commonly as ABC, is one of the biggest messages I can ever think of. Please to inform their lordships that the Italian fleet is a tanker under the guns of the fortress of Malta. Malta well, dog. I've been asked about Malta dog. It was a sort of, sort of uh, pretty violent enteritis, and the only cure for it, the the, the MO down here had, uh, was a chalk and opium pill, which he said would really work very well if you uh, 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 send it down with, with with a port and brandy mixed. You see, <laughs> and I must say it did take some of the pain away. <laughs> well, it but seems that's to what Malta dog. Was. Well, it seems to me Malta dog was right here. The people going into the john, sitting on it, <laughs> with a blanket over them, and coming at both ends, <laughs> which yes. was... Well, it, 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 it was very unpleasant very indeed. I, I and very weak thing. Well, very you know, weak. Was, well, I terrible. Wasn't, a, wasn't a bad sufferer, but I do remember yeah. very well uh, Stan Grant, who had 249 just before me, uh, had uh, a, a very, very strict rules about it. I mean, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have pilots flying That's with right. the dog. And, uh, you know, we were all so keen to fly and get at them and so on. And there was a New Zealander called Jeff West who had flown in Douglas right. Bardo's wing at uh, Tangmere. Now, he was a terrible sufferer from this. I mean, he used to get it about every 10 or 12 days. And, you know, he really let fly when he, uh, about the unpleasantness of it. And I can remember one conversation one morning. And uh, Stan Grant came down and Jeff had had it, you know, pretty badly. And he said, Jeff, do you feel any better today? And uh, Jeff said, yes, I do, sir, but I don't think I could do more than 40 minutes in the cockpit, sir. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so Stan said to him, ah, oh, yes, Jeff, but uh, do you feel that you can fart? <laughs> and he said, no, sir, because I don't want to. <laughs> 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 uh, it was a very unpleasant disease. The other thing was sandfly right. fever. The Sunderland I was supposed to be on to go to the Middle East, sort of tour expired here after nine months. 
um, was sunk at its moorings in Califrano Bay. And uh, so I had to wait for the next one. And the AOC, through Woody, Woodhall, sent me a message saying if, if uh, Donald Stone thinks he's going to d uh, uh, cause a drought in the bars of the letter while he waits for his next Sunderland, he is mistaken. <laughs> he is to take a VHF set and one, one of the sergeant pirates who's going with him to the Middle East and a yeoman of signals from the Navy and they are to become visual controllers at the Palace Tower overlooking Customs House steps in Malta. And the job <laughs> is to shout at the boys, all his friends, saying, 109 behind you, for God's sake, break, break, and that sort of thing, which was, uh, which was our job. And, uh, and when, when April was coming up, I thought I'd test the, 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 the controllers down in the, in, in the pit, in the ditch, you see, and say, 30-plus uh, over St. Paul's Bay. And before I could say, April Fool practice, <laughs> all the sirens in the island went off, you see. <laughs> and so I was cranking this handset, field telephone, saying, look, it's only a joke, it's only a joke. And when he came back, he said, some joke. Uh, uh, um, uh, Group Captain Woodhall wants to see you at 5 o'clock in his office. So, my flight sergeant pilot said, you're for it now, this time, you see. And when I got down there, he said, uh, I didn't, didn't tell me to sit down immediately. He said, you better read this from Air Ministry. So I thought, well, how can they have arranged a court-martial quite so quickly, you see? And it happened this morning. And fortunately, it said, uh, inform Flight Lieutenant Stones, he's been awarded a bar to his DFC. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and Woody being Woody said, now, go down to that little draper's shop, get that tit sewn on your faded DFC, and I'll take you up to Carly tonight and we'll have a party. <laughs> Walter's scouts helped the injured, took part in civil defence and set up their own air raid warning system. The island's governor, Lord Gort, presented them with the Bronze Cross for special heroism and extraordinary work. We were all here on the island, you couldn't get away anyhow. And we were a very close-knit sort of family. We knew most of, all, most yes, of the pilots, yes. knew one another. I knew quite a lot of the bomber pilots and the, and the fleet arm pilots. And we got to know the Maltese very well and the other services, the submariners, the army, the, 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 the gunners. And there was never another place like it. We were rather like a close-knit family. And when, when part of it got hurt, you really felt it. Yeah, that's right. When I went back to England, gave me I had great confidence back in the air for my next tour, which was, and I used to fly as number two to Johnny Johnson, mm. again another great yeah, wartime sure. pilot, and I, I think it was what I learnt out here that yeah. gave me the, you know, the. Oh, I'm sure of that. My memory of the place, really, curiously enough, is not a personal one about myself, but was about our AOC, who, uh, Hugh Pugh Lloyd, who really was a <laughs> marvellous leader and a wonderful chap to work with, and as a squadron commander, he could not possibly have been better uh, to work with. And I can remember he was wonderfully good at these pep talks that he used to yes. give, and I can remember one bunch of pilots came in, I think off the wasp, and he gave one of these theatrical performances, which he was always very good at, with a whiskey and soda in one hand and a mm. cigarette smoke through a long holder in the other, and uh, with plenty of theatre, plenty of pauses, plenty of nuances and all that. And I can remember him finishing one of these talks off by saying, and so, gentlemen, you know how the battle lies here. Win this fighter battle, and all the rest of your life you will be able to say, I am proud to have been here. Very true.
who played such a gallant role in the siege of Malta. May I ask you to accept these four guns, which your government has pledged to maintain as a sacred memorial to the gunners who served in the siege, British and Maltese together. The four guns which I humbly accept in the name of the people of Malta for us to keep and to serve the purposes of peace and friendship. This is an example of true loyalty to regiment. Uh, to have got by his personal efforts and persuaded people to get these guns here, to get them in such good condition and then bring so many members of the 4th Heavy Anti-Aircraft Regiment who actually fought the guns during the siege is a tremendous personal effort on his behalf and should be recognized as such. He's overcome enormous hurdles to do it. When I first heard about it in my capacity as the master gunner St. James's Park in London, um, I said we had to give absolute support to this. And we managed to help him get the guns to a workshop, get them all stripped down and cleaned and sorted out and then shipped. But he arranged it, he made the plan. He, the tribute is to him. The George Cross Island Association commissioned a memorial bell to honour the 7,000 who gave their lives. Lord Lewin is president. The veterans of the George Cross Island Association, renewing old friendships when retirement gave them time to revisit Malta, felt there should be some lasting memorial of those times, and particularly a tribute to the many men, women, and children who lost their lives. Mr. President, in 1942, your former Chief Justice, Professor Cremona, wrote the following lines. From here, orgies of noise and violence, scattered about the ordered bones as steel, attacked the substance of all softer things and caused the island and the earth to reel. This impressive monument, which we inaugurate today, commemorates thousands of men, women, and children of Malta and other lands beyond the sea who died in the defense of these islands 50 years ago. For their gallantry in that struggle, my father, King George VI, awarded the George Cross to the island fortress of Malta to honor her brave people and to bear witness to a heroism and devotion that will long be famous in history. Two years earlier, about the time when the war correspondent Alexander Clifford conceived the imaginative idea of an award to the island, the king had written, I have already heard of the gallant and fine bearing of the Maltese people since they have been brought within the battle zone. And I have no doubt that they will be worthy of upholding their great tradition in this struggle in which they are now actively engaged. He was right. They were worthy. Their heroism and devotion will long be famous in history. We must continue to bear witness to that. This monument is a magnificent and lasting symbol of the spirit which my father recognized. I am proud to walk in his footsteps and to share with you, Mr. President, the honor of dedicating the Siege Bell Memorial on the George Cross Island. In a way,
way, looking back, it was a wonderful period. I wouldn't have missed it for worlds, really. Malta is now a peaceful, prosperous island attracting a million tourists a year. Some don't wish to remember the events of 50 years ago. Others believe the world must never be allowed to forget.